Hello everyone and welcome back to another short video, part of a series of chats I am having with various authors who contributed a chapter to my forthcoming edited book, A Brief History of Economic Thought, From the Mercantilists to the Post-Keynesians. The idea for this book came about a few years ago when my co-editor, Hassan Bougrin and I, felt there were no history of thought book from a perspective of the heterodox voice aimed for an undergraduate audience. In addition to the book, I wanted to do something slightly different. So uh, I wanted to do a series or, of a dozen or so video chats where I sit down with each author of the book to discuss the salient arguments of their respective contributions and to have a, an overall discussion on the history of economic thought. I do believe this is the first time something like this is being done. Now, this book is intended for an undergraduate audience, and I'm hoping that these 10 to 15 minute video chats will be used as a pedagogical tool along with the chapters. I think students will learn quite a lot from these videos. Our guest today is Stephen Pressman, an affiliate professor of economics at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado, and emeritus professor of economics and finance at Monmouth University in West Long Beach, Long Branch, New Jersey. In addition, he serves as associate editor of the Review of Political Economy, where he was editor for 25 years. His main research areas are poverty and income distribution, post-Keynesian macroeconomics, and the history of economic thought. Over his career, he has published more than 190 articles in refereed journals and book chapters, has authored or edited 18 books, including Understanding Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, A New Guide to the Post-Keynesian uh, Economics, and uh, Alternative Theories of the State, as well as 50 Major Economists, which has been translated into five languages. He is a frequent contrib contributor to newspapers such as the Chicago Tribune, the Denver Post, Los Angeles Times, and the San Francisco Chronicle, and to popular periodicals such as Challenge Magazine, the Washington Spectator, and Dollars and Cents. Well, Steve, thank you very much for sitting down uh, with me today to discuss your chapter. You and I go back 25 years or so when I was a student at the New School, um, where, which is where you also did your, uh, your, your studies. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a pleasure to uh, come for full circle and to sit down with you today. So let me ask you the first question. This book has a chapter on Keynes, on the Keynesians, on the post-Keynesians, and now your chapter on the new Keynesians. And this can be a little bit confusing to the students. So a two-part first question, who are the new Keynesians and why and how did they arrive? Let me answer those questions in reverse order, um, because I think that uh, to really understand New Keynesian economics, you need to understand like why it arose. And really, New Keynesian economics can best be described as a cure for a disease. Um, and so you need to understand what the disease was. And the disease that New Keynesian economics responded to is, new classical economics or rational expectations. Um, and rational expectations uh, believes that individuals are all rational and that markets perform sort of perfectly and quickly reach equilibrium. And what that means is that there are gonna be no macroeconomic problems like unemployment, the sorts of problems that Keynes worried about and tried to address in his book, The General Theory. Um, and just to give a little concrete example of what the problem is, um, uh, if you decide that uh, you're going to hold out for a job because you want to get paid $100,000 while the going rate is $50,000, nobody's going to hire you. And so you're going to wind up being unemployed. But what the new classical school argued is that people are rational. Um, and they're going to realize very quickly when they can't get $100,000 and all employers are saying, we're offering you half that amount. And you go and say, no, but I think I'm worth a whole lot more. I'm worth twice as much as everybody else. I want $100,000. 
at some point they're going to laugh at you. And at some point soon, you're going to realize that you have to take the lower wage. And so markets are going to quickly clear. People are going to be rational. Unemployment's going to go away. And we really, as a policy solution, we don't need to do anything because everything's going to take care of itself. And I think probably the best way to describe the the rational expectations school is it, it became in macroeconomics sort of like the Omicron variant of the coronavirus. All macroeconomists were sort of infected with it and infected with it really quickly. And um, while we were both new school graduates, um, you had the fortune to have been a generation after me um, at the new school. I was there in the late 70s and early 1980s. This was the heyday of rational expectations. And the, the economists who were macroeconomists who didn't take that approach were, were really laughed at and ridiculed by the profession. Um, in my chapter for your book, there's a quote from Greg Mankiw, who's one of the more prominent figures in the New Keynesian school, where he talked about like at seminars, they would snicker at anybody who brought up anything Keynesian. And in some cases, there was outright laughter at the people that were professing to be Keynesians or some sort of Keynesian. And so um, what new Keynesian economics try to do is to give some respectability to the ideas of Keynes and the ideas of Keynesian economics um, and to make them somewhat immune from the ridicule and the criticism of Keynesian economics that the rational expectations, new classical school were bringing forth. And so it was, a, it was essentially a game of sorts that the new Keynesians were playing. It was, how can we possibly explain the existence and the continuation of unemployment and open the door for policy solutions to deal with unemployment when there was a problem, um, but still start out from the assumptions that the new classicals began with, which were assumptions about people being rational and how people behaved and also how markets worked and how markets cleared pretty quickly. Now, as uh, one of the elements of the rational expectations that uh, uh, spread like Omicron is the idea of micro foundations. Um, as, a, um, as a generalization, would you characterize new Keynesians as being old Keynesians with micro foundations? Um, I, I really don't think that, uh, that they were all um, sort of old Keynesians. Um, some of them were pragmatists. Um, I, I generally look at the, the sort of school as, it, it, in fact, it, it almost isn't a school um, because just the, the diversity of the people that have been associated with this uprising, let's say, against rational expectations, macroeconomics, um, were, were just really very broad and very diverse. Um, and I, I think it, it may be better to describe it as having two wings. There's a conservative wing. Um, Greg Mankiw, whom I mentioned previously, was the head of the Council of Economic Advisors for George W. Bush. That's Bush number two in the early 2000s. Um, and um, was and still is a sort of conservative Republican. He has since left the conservative, the, the Republican Party because of Trump, but he's still a pretty conservative economist in the, in the big scheme of things. And um, really from Mankiw's point of view, the big problem with the, the new classical school was that like, there were rigidities. It was all about wage rigidities and price rigidities. And everything would work out much better if we just rid the economy of these rigidities. But still, Mankiw recognized that the world is operating. The economic world functions with these rigidities, that these rigidities exist for a reason. They have a purpose and a function. And we've got policy. 
and the policy should always be let's make markets perfect or let's make markets more perfect you know closer to what the new classical people say on the other extreme you have people that are generally associated with sort of the left wing of the economics profession um, people lot who are who are very very Keynesian in their orientation people like George Akerlof and Joe Stiglitz um, both very prominent um, New Keynesian ec uh, economists, both of whom made significant contributions to New Keynesian economics. And I think that more from the Stiglitz, secondarily from Akerlof, um, they're, you know, they were worried about sort of like getting the theory right, which Mankiw wasn't really worried about. Mankiw was worried about let's open the door for some policy. And let's let's see if we can get markets as perfect as possible. Stiglitz and Akerlof recognized that markets just they were never going to be anything close to the the perfect markets that neoclassical economists and the new classical economists hoped that they would be. And so, therefore, we need policies to deal with the consequences of this situation. Uh, what are some of the policies that Mac, that new Keynesian macroeconomists would uh, would propose today that would be associated with them today? Um, I mean, there really aren't any policies that I would associate with the the new Keynesian economists other than the the well the, the Mancu policies. Um, uh, which would basically be, let's see how we can get economies to function better. Um, here's one sort of standard example of these rigidities that could screw up economies and lead to prolonged bouts of unemployment. Um, labor contracts, okay? Um, labor contracts generally run for three years. And there are good reasons why labor contracts run for three years. And there's a good literature in the new Keynesian economics tradition about labor contracts and, and why they arose for rational purposes and, and what their negative effects are. And really, if you've got a three-year labor contract and you've got high unemployment, then so wages need to fall, you can't do it until you have a new contract that needs to be negotiated. Um, and so, uh, the new Keynesians recognize that there are good reasons for these three-year contracts. It is even rational to have them. Um, and one reason is nobody wants to have to renegotiate a contract every year. Um, another is it's easier to plan workers' businesses if you know what your wages are going to be, at least for a relatively short period of time, especially for business firms. Um, but having that three-year labor contract introduces inflexibilities into the economy. And but so Man the, the Mancu stream well, okay. of the, uh, the New Keynesian economics would sort of go, well, maybe we can just get rid of those three-year labor contracts. You know, can we do, reduce it to two? Can we reduce it to one and a half years? Let's try to get rid of the rigidity somehow. If we get rid of the rigidities, then labor markets will clear and we'll get to full employment more quickly. On the other hand, the people like Joe Stiglitz really are sort of pretty much sort of Keynesians, followers of Keynes, post-Keynesians at, at many times. And they recognize that there is a problem of demand. And the, the real issue is we've got to get demand up. And unless we get demand up, then we're not going to solve the unemployment problem. So that's why I said this is this is almost not a, a school. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. is just a this is just a group of people rebelling against you know some disease that had hit macroeconomics and try to eradicate it as quickly as possible. Now you mentioned three-year contracts. A post-Keynesian would say that it reduces uncertainty, um, and I think that there is probably a link there with with the post Keynesians, with Keynes. Um, yeah, now, no doubt. There's been a lot of, you know, uh, Skidelsky wrote a book uh, at, uh, in 2009, I think called The Return of the Master. And- uh, Very good book. 
Yeah, yeah, I agree. And so there has been since 2008, 2009, and again with COVID, a return to Keynes. Um, is this, are we living through sort of a, a, a reemergence of Keynes, a reappreciation of Keynes through the works of maybe the post Keynesians? But if you look at some works being done in central banks, uh, et cetera, they have a distinct Keynesian flavor, many of them. Um, no, I think, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and uh, if you want to think about like what the contribution is of new Keynesian economics, you know, what good it's done for the profession. Um, the real good that it's done is it's effectively been like the, the vaccination or the shot that we all take for COVID, right? And so now we're protected from the, the Omicron variant, which infects everybody in macroeconomics. And I'm really jealous of you uh, in terms of when you studied economics at the New School. Um, I studied uh, in the late 70s and early 80s. When I graduated, rational expectations was at, at its heyday. Everybody was a, a, a rational expectations, new classical economist. They laughed at anybody who even brought up Keynes. You came out a generation later in the 90s. By then, the disease had by and large gone. And Keynes had a resurgence by then. And I think that the real resurgence of Keynes, you were right, and Skidelsky's right in his book, was the, you know, the what happened in the 2000s, both with the financial crisis and the Great Recession, and then with the, uh, the Omicron uh, and, and other variants of the coronavirus. Um, and just to actually put this into some sort of perspective to actually get a real sense of why New Keynesian economics was so important. Um, let's suppose this didn't happen at all. Let's suppose that new classical economics remain the dominant paradigm in all of macroeconomics and that new classical economists, rational expectations people were dominating central banks, they were dominating the government, and then we had the Great Recession, and then we had the Omicron pandemic, right? The, the coronavirus pandemic. What would be the response? The, res the policy response would be nothing, yeah. right? The policy response would be zero. What condition would the economy of the world be like now? What would have happened in 2009 and 10 had there been no Keynesian response? All right. Really, we would have been at Great Depression number two. Now, Keynes wrote the general theory in 1936 in the middle of the depression, right? This was the problem that he was addressing. The, the, the full name of the book is the general theory of employment, interest, and money, and employment comes first. This is what Keynes was worried about. Keynes was worried about making sure that there was sufficient employment. And you can go back even further in history. Um, uh, before the Great Depression, let's see, it was the Panic of 1907, um, which you know, not too many people study. Everybody knows Great Depression, but the Panic of 1907, um, it was the Knickerbocker Bank in New York, one of the largest banks in the entire country, it collapsed, um, and people lost a lot of money. Um, and at the same time, San Francisco, which was sort of the financial center of the West Coast, the Western part of the United States, um, had the humongous earthquake, which leveled San Francisco and destroyed everything. Um, and everybody was worried about losing their money in banks in San Francisco as well. And the result was a panic in 1907. And as a result of that, um, this, the, the Federal Reserve was created in the United States to be able to deal with problems like this. Um, you know, there were solutions that were put forward. And even going further back in history, the 1890s actually was called the Great Depression before the 1930s. If you just look back at history, 
once we had an industrialized economy, it was a regular situation of depression, 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 or severe recession or collapse and panic. And, and that's really what Keynes was worried about. And that's what Keynes was addressing, trying to understand it, to try to come up with some policy solutions to prevent that from happening. And he got it right. Keynes got it right. And, and, and then there was the, the rebellion against it. And yeah. part of the rebellion was monetarism. Uh, part of the rebellion was the rational expectations, new classical macroeconomics, which had the policy conclusion, the problems will take care of themselves. You don't have to worry about it. But history shows that to be wrong. And had we not killed off the virus of new classical uh, economics or rational expectations, macroeconomics, when the bad crises hit in the 2000s, we would have been in Great Depression too. Yes, I, I completely agree. And I'm reminded of this quote, maybe it was Mankiw, I'm not sure. Uh, we're all Keynesians in a foxhole. Uh, and I'll tell you why I, I, I think that, that that is wrong. Because if you look at the history of capitalism in the last century or so, you see that financial or some sort of crises happen all the time now. Um, and so we need Keynes more than ever now uh, than we did, uh, than we would have needed him two, 300 years ago. Um, the financial crises were far um, uh, in between, uh, but not in the last hundred years. So we need Keynes more than ever. Well, well, I, I think that um, I can make a little bit of, a, of a, a, an amendment to what you just said, because I think it's right. Um, if we're in a foxhole, we need Keynes, absolutely. But think about what the foxhole is. The foxhole is um, now we have a health crisis throughout the world and nobody can go to work and people need to stay home. What do we do, right? Now we're in the foxhole. Now, of course, we're going to get out of that foxhole soon. And then the question is, when we get out of that foxhole, what happens? Yeah. You know, do we, you know, do we need canes? Or, uh, in fact, let me be more specific than do we need canes? Because what canes is, is a subject of some dispute. Um, you're looking around for something. Well, I, I was looking for my... Uh... I have a mask that says, what would Keynes do? <laughs> <laughs> but, well, I, but I think that's, that's the right question. Yeah, yeah. What would Keynes do, but not, not during the crisis? And, and I think that's the big plus of the new Keynesian school is they, they were pragmatists at heart. That's what brought Mankiw and Stiglitz together to form what's effectively a same school with two very, very different people. Yeah. Um, what brought them together was a pragmatic realization that when we're at war, we need in the foxhole to come to Keynes. We need Keynes and Keynesian policies. The question is, when we're not at war, what do we do? Okay, if you look at the, the several decades after World War II, we really didn't need a lot of Keynes. We had some Keynes set up, they were structures, but we didn't need a lot of Keynes. The economy performed fairly well. And of course, it could be argued that it was due to some of the Keynesian sorts of things that were in place, but we really didn't need Keynes. We weren't desperate for Keynes. We weren't in a foxhole. Um, but then the question is, what happens when we're out of the foxhole? When we're out of the foxhole, um, the question is, should, be, we, should we be running large deficits or not? And Keynes really was skeptical of this. Now, Keynes really was in favor of over business cycles, keeping government budgets relatively balanced. Um, so, you know, in a sense, that's not a, a, a Keynesian sort of policy. Um, and I think that you know, that's probably a little bit closer to what somebody like Greg Mankiw might be in favor of, and a little bit less of what somebody like Joe Stiglitz would be in favor of, who recognizes that we still need the policies because there are always going to be problems. And, you know, yes, you're right. 
you know, problems arise during the time when there's no crisis, and when can... every everybody becomes more optimistic, the animal spirits, yeah. which is something that George Akerlof has written about. Now, the animal spirits start to bubble up and up and up and up. And everybody takes on more and more risks because this is what Hyminsky said, another post-Keynesian, um, is we need to really worry about what's happening in the calm times because people become more confident that reinforces their expectations. Um, it may not be perfectly rational, but this is how people behave. And this just leads to what's gonna be the next crisis as people become overconfident and do all sorts of stupid things. Yeah. And, then we've, and then things collapse and then we've got to bail the system out. And, and the right thing to do afterwards is you've got to figure out how do we keep the system in check so that the bubbles don't get as big. Absolutely, I agree. Okay, Steve, Stephen Pressman, very nice talking with you and always. Likewise. And uh, thank you for sitting down with us. And thank you for inviting me. Thank you for asking me to write for the book. Um, it is a, uh, uh, a much needed project. I hope it is a huge success. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Take care. <laughs>